bringing you in-depth discussion from one of the rad groups of online writers covering the Edmonton Oilers. Are you ready for Oilers Overtime? Oilers. Join us as we talk news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and more. All featured on one of the most glorified teams in the NHL. From the great one to the next one. From the boys on the bus to the decade of darkness. This is Oilers Overtime. Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another edition of THW Oilers Overtime. My name is Jim Parsons. I'm here with thehockeyraiders.com. We are one shy of our regular cast of characters, but that's okay. We're going to catch Colton next week. But we've got Julian Mongilo with us. Uh, just watched the hockey game, so we're going to have lots to talk about. Julian, how are you? Doing good. Another 3 nothing win in the books for the Oilers, so they're rolling right now. They're looking pretty good. Yeah, they did okay. I mean, they, they were toying with being outshot, which has been pretty rare for them. Uh, over the last few games because they've been up in their shot totals and and kind of shutting everybody else down with the exception of a couple games. But, uh, yeah, they got the shutout for Koskinen tonight, who played really, really well. So we'll talk about that too. Brian Swain is with us. Uh, Brian, how are you? Yeah, good, Jim. It just occurred to me, remember before Christmas, like every time we were doing, we were taping or recording on the night of a game, they would lose. That's how good they're playing right now, that they have managed to transcend our jinx. Of recording on the same night as them playing, so like that's how you know this team is putting it all together. Well, let's yeah. I mean, they were one and two on the Eastern Road Trip here that we were talking about last week, and we'll mm-hmm. we'll get into details on that one. But I thought they played pretty good. So, uh, but this was by far, uh, I think, their best game of the last four since we recorded. So, um, I think this was a good good win for them. They're going to go into play Chicago next, which I think is another you know, winnable game. So they could be kind of on the roll here. So let's. Let's get right into it. Uh, before we do, just a quick reminder to everybody who is watching this, if you want to check out the MorningSkate.io newsletter, you can sign up for that. It's your daily hit of news and rumors and topics around the NHL. Uh, a lot of fun. It's an easy, quick way to drink your coffee and get a lot of NHL news. So sign up for that one with the Hockey Raiders. But let's get right into the game. For people who are watching this, the game will have happened last night. For us recording this, this game literally ended about 15 minutes ago. Uh, Oilers win 3-0 over the Philadelphia Flyers. Coming back from a, well, I guess they're in Philly, but uh, coming back from a three game swing against Carolina, Tampa Bay, and Florida, where they were one and two. And we said last week that it was kind of going to be important that they at least showed up for those games. And I think they did, but they had the best game tonight against Philadelphia. Uh, Julian, what did you think of the win? Well, I thought, I thought they played really great, solid all around. Defense was good, um, made life for the goaltenders easy. Uh, Koskinen gets the shutout and it's he said it after the game if, if you guys stuck around to hear it but he he just said you know they made it easy on me a lot of perimeter shots kept everybody the outside and that's that's something i think that they struggled with is is letting guys into the the in front of the net too easily and and giving up too many chances in front of the net so um you know that that kind of speaks to to um helping out the goalies um but like you said overall it's it's fourth game of a five game road trip and i think they still have that energy i mean the flyers aren't the the best team obviously but Hey, a win's a win, and and you take them any way you can get them this time of year. He's being generous when he says that the Oilers did a really good job of shutting everything out. They did an okay job shutting it, but he had some really key saves. Like he had he four or five really high end scoring chances that he shut right down. So kudos to Miko Koskinen. He's being uh, generous and he's being humble, but he played really, really well. And this is now the second game in a row that he's played, you know, some pretty good hockey. What do you think of his performance, Brian? Yeah, he was full value for the show tonight. Uh, he came up with some big stops. He's been their best goalie on the show. So he's been their best goalie for the last five weeks, really. Um, I was I was doing the stats before the game, and he's 7-1-1 in his last eight starts. Mike Smith is 3-5 and five in that stretch. So, I mean, you know, uh, com- comparable sample size. Um, Koskinen has been the better goalie. And for people who say that, this you you can't risk overplaying him because once he makes two or three starts in a row, I think that's that's the one thing that could maybe prevent from the prevent them from just saying that he's the go-to guy right now. Because obviously Skinner is not in the plans. Like I just don't think I think, and I'm sure we'll get into that. But um, yeah. yeah, so I'm kind of all over the place here right now. But yeah, great, uh, very nice game, very nice game tonight, and uh, he, he deserved that. No, that's good. We'll put a pin in it just because we're going to talk about Koskinen as a potential starter here down at the end of the show here. But yeah, I thought he played really well for me. The the key takeaways were I thought 
Uh, the Oilers were, you know, they started okay on their power play, but they struggled a little bit. But Philadelphia is just so bad on the penalty kill, right? Yeah. And they yeah. just, the Oilers had opportunities. They weren't being faced with a really aggressive shutdown. Uh, I thought some of the depth guys played pretty well. I like the fact that Duncan Keith was back in the lineup. I thought he played a solid game, even though you didn't really notice him a whole lot, which is really good, right? When you don't see him uh, making a huge difference, that means he's not messing up in the first game back in a while. He said in an interview prior to the game today, Julian, that he was good to go. Like it wasn't one of those things where he was, you know, just cleared today. He felt like he was ready. It was just a precautionary thing that they were holding him out and he was ready I don't know when exactly, but he felt like he was good to go. So um, I think they just decided to give it a little more time and, and rest him. And I thought it was a, you know, a good game by him. What'd you think of Duck and Keith's performance? No, he looked good. That's what you're going to get from him, right? If he's, he's done it long enough that he can just jump right in and do his job. And, you know, they've, they've still rolled those seven defense out there. So it's still kind of weird, even with Keith being back, that they're still playing those, those, that, that extra guy there. Um I'm not sure how that kind of shakes down on the stretch. I, th- I think they just like the amount of like the depth that they, they're, they're given with and the, all the, all the different types of, of combinations they can go with. Cause I think they like what Nem Malinen's bringing, you know, physically and, and his game's been solid. So I don't think they want to get rid of them and that's kind of where they're at right now. So they got to just play with what they have. And if that means seven guys and they're your best seven guys and you got to throw them out there, but Keith looks good. Um, and, and at that point, to that point, I mean, you, you, do you do you even need to really go get anybody at the deadline for, on your defense if you have a, a plethora of guys that you can kind of throw in the mix? Well, if he comes back and plays like he did when he left, I don't know that you do, right? Duncan Keith was really solid. He arguably the best defenseman. You know, Nurse plays the most minutes. He's the number one guy, but he had moments where he wasn't. But Keith was consistent. Like for all of the people that, and, and I've always said, I hate the deal. I don't like the trade. I think he could have, you know, Chicago should have retained some salary, but I never was opposed to Duncan Keith coming in here because I thought he'd be a pretty good pickup, good leader, solid defenseman in the right amount of minutes. And he's been that he's been really, really solid. I do like, I don't know, Brian, maybe you noticed this or not. Do you know what the original pairing was today going in with Duncan Keith? Was he with Bouchard? Cause I noticed he played with Bouchard a lot, but um, I thought he settled Bouchard down a little bit, which is really kind of important, right? Because Bouchard has struggled a little. He's, pinched when he shouldn't he's made terrible plays at the opposition's blue line which has led to two on ones the other way and a handful of goals he's turned overs but i thought he was a little more calm today and, and played more offensively which we know bouchard for uh he put that one shot in and we'll talk about yamamoto in a second but he had all the time in the world to walk in there put that shot on net and then banging and crashing and eventually it results in a goal i thought bouchard was better and i want to give a little bit of credit to duncan keith for that because i think he played a pretty big role there what do you think yeah, well, I 100% agree with uh, Bouchard having a better game tonight and looking more composed. Um, and that's an interesting observation. How much of that can we attribute to Duncan Keith? Uh, Bouchard has been playing mostly with Nurse this year. And I think it's been good for his development. But maybe this is the next step playing him with Keith is what can kind of help him shore up those areas. Because we were talking before we started recording here, he's had a bit of a rough stretch lately. Uh, the warts in his game is showing. So this might be exactly what he needs. So, yeah, you know, to be honest, I hadn't thought about that a ton before you just mentioned it. But if that's the case, then, uh, you know, this this might be a good thing to moving forward. I'd have to go back and actually look at the minutes. Like, we're too fresh after the game to know exactly how many minutes they played together. Like, I'm not sure if Keith and Bouchard actually played most of the minutes. I did notice them together in a couple pairings, but I don't know for sure exactly how many minutes but i'd be curious to know because if they were slotted together for most of the game mm-hmm. that, that might have had an effect here but i i honestly don't know that's why i asked kind of is like was that the pairing like i wasn't really sure if i think it was it heading in i think it was the idea heading in yeah no it's been good uh julian what do you think about the road trip so we talked about it last week we said they needed to show up uh i thought in the tampa game they might get the loser point maybe go to overtime and lose uh they were in it but They didn't end up pulling out the victory there. Uh, They did win against Florida, which I thought was really good. And Carolina just outplayed them. I thought they were right in the game, though, until the very end, which clearly they were. Almost got tied in there, but I thought it was a decent showing. I mean, it's not the record you want. You certainly don't want to go one and two when you can uh, get a couple extra points if you're in those games. But I thought they showed up pretty good against three of the best teams in the NHL. What would you think? Yeah, I think that that it's a positive it's it, there's a lot of silver linings I'll say from, from that road trip. I think that they played well, especially being down 
um, with the injuries they've kind of had to go through the last couple of games. So considering all that considered, I think they, they were able to, to put together good efforts and, and show that they're able to compete at least with some of the top teams in the East. Um, you know, they if being able to get, get contributions from sources that they don't usually get them. I think those guys are, are, are stepping up and filling those roles. And I think that's important moving forward is that next man up mentality. And if they can keep getting those contributions, then, you know, from their depth guys, then, then it, like we said before, it takes loads off of their, their top guys. Right. So even when they're not going, they're able to, to stay in games and, you know, the goaltending has been solid. They, that one against Koskin and played a hell of a game again and uh, against Florida there and almost stole them that, that point or the, the, the points at the ex, uh, end of the game there. So, I mean, it's hard to kind of, you know, say that it's a positive showing because, you know, you only get what two points out of it yeah, all, but points, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to say that it was, it was successful, but I, I think it was definitely positive uh, effort moving forward, especially being three games into a five game road trip. Right. So, um, you know, they bounce back now and they put another two points in the bank. So uh, keep the standings close and hopefully get into that playoff spot. Was there anything, Brian, that concerned you in watching those games or stood out on the other end, really positives that you took away from those three contests against those three pretty formidable teams? I was just generally encouraged. I thought the consistency in their efforts, um, I thought they played fairly cerebral games. I didn't see a lot of the mistakes that have been killing them earlier in the season. Um, so, yeah, I, I was overall impressed. I mean, I think you, you, we were saying that tonight it was their best game of the road trip. I think their best game of the road trip might have been in Tampa. Like, I thought they played really well against a very good team, and uh, they deserved better. They lost that game because of goaltending, um, if we're going to be blunt about it. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a really encouraging performance. I mean, they could have, they, they could, they easily could have won the Carolina game too. So, um, I'm very happy and looking at the road trip as a whole, like if we had said they, they could get six points out of it, I think we would have taken that. I was and just going to ask, is that considered a win if they get six yeah. out of the 10 points? Well, I think, I think if you looked at these five games and said, yeah, we'd get six points. We might have even said that last week. I, I think we'd be happy with that. I still got to take care of business in Chicago. Chicago's given them some uh, some grief this season, but yeah, that would be a successful trip in my opinion. Yeah, the one thing I will say about the Tampa game uh, was that they had a really rough start. You know, between their defense letting some shots in for Mike Smith, and then Mike Smith not really being able to be there and and get those saves when you're not playing so great. Like that's what they say of a starter, right? You can steal a couple games, or you can steal a game, or you can steal all period. And he didn't, right? And so that was yeah. the big. The big issue in Tampa and it just put it behind and they weren't really able to come back from it. But uh, yeah, I thought it was okay. I was, I was happy so far. I mean, like you said, they got to win against Chicago. If they win against Chicago, um, we'll call this road trip a victory. If they don't, it's going to be a little disappointing, but they were in the games and that's a good sign. And as long as they don't really fall out of the Pacific, they're third right now after the win tonight and Vegas is a little behind them. Uh, but if they can stay in that spot after this road trip, I mean, they're in good shape. So uh, that's a really, really positive sign for me. So let's hope that that sort of thing continues. Let's talk a little bit about the injuries because the Oilers got creamed. Like over this road trip, they lost. I guess not over this road trip, but in the last little bit. So they lost Duncan Keith, but he's back. They lost Jesse Pugliarvi. They've lost Zach Cassian. They lost Kyler Yamamoto to a block shot. He missed a game, but he came back tonight and scored a goal, which is great. And they lost Ryan Nugent Hopkins now, which we've learned is at least two to three weeks which is huge. That's a, it's not good at all. How bad is this Julian? Like they pulled out a win tonight without a, a handful of those guys. Is it a real problem? Is it okay? Well, we got two weeks without Nugent Hopkins, maybe three. We'll see where he's at. Uh, what do you think happens here now that these injuries have sort of taken it's right when they were getting all their yeah. depth, you know, when they had all their lineups the way they wanted them figured out, they had that top nine set. And now it's just like, just throw the wrench back in the blender, back in the blender. Let's put everything back in the blender. Um, You know, he still hasn't really, we haven't seen Woodcroft like go to that fourth line. Benson gets like another eight minutes tonight. Um, Brad Malone gets in the lineup, you know, like we got, you know, sticking, just plugging different players in. So um, Derek Ryan stepped up since, since Nugent Hopkins has been, you know, gone down. So I think that's a positive. Um, I think they can sustain themselves for the time being and, and afford to, um, 
continue their the, the play that they're they're with now just because of the schedule they have coming up. They have a lot of easier games coming up. Um, I think they play the Flames. I think only two two teams that they that are actually in a playoff spot right now. So they have a, somewhat of an easy schedule and a lot of home games coming up before the deadline. So I think it's going to be important for them to be able to show that they at least can get through that little stretch um, and then hopefully get Nugent Hopkins back by time it's all said and done to when the schedule heats up, I guess they, I think they get Colorado on deadline day and then Minnesota or something like that again. So they got two big games coming up after that, but if they can kind of get through the next couple of weeks, which I think they're have the right people that they can do that. Um, you know, you can expect more Hyman's been, been carrying a lot of the load. Uh, we've been talking about him a couple of days, uh, a couple of weeks ago as well. So I think it's just a collective effort. And as long as Yamamoto and guys like that are contributing, um, I think they'll be okay to get through the rest of it. Brian, how big of a deal is it, do you think? I mean, Julian kind of mentioned it a little bit, but what happens if, you know, the Oilers go on a little bit of a roll here? Like, yes, Calgary's a very really tough team. They're playing fantastic hockey right now. But what if the Oilers win a handful in a row and then you get Pugliarvi back, then you get Nugent Hopkins back? I mean, is that like a bunch of trade deadline deals in a way? Yeah. I you was know, just like going to say, that's, that's a hell of an addition at the deadline, right? Because I don't think any other big trades are coming in. So, yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Um, I, I don't know about you guys. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here. I haven't found myself at any point in these last few games, like saying like, Oh man, they really missed Newt's tonight. Or, Oh man, they really missed mm-hmm. uh, the Bison game tonight. I just, I, um, next man up has worked so far. And, and maybe that only gets you so far, right? Maybe that this time next week we're saying, Oh man, okay. The, the, there's glaring absences in the lineup right now. But uh, this is speaking to the depth. Like, Julian, you, you made the point that um, they're getting contributions from guys they don't usually, but get, you, you usually get contributions from. But in the Jay Woodcroft era, that is, they do usually <laughs> contribute, right? Like, this is, yeah. this is kind of becoming the new norm. And I know it's only 10 games, but if this is how it continues to go moving forward, this, this is the recipe for success. This is what Stanley Cup championship contending teams, this is how they operate. Do. Yeah. So you brought it up. I'll ask you, Brian, do you think someone like Derek Ryan can you know, sustain this? Like, I mean, he's been incredibly hot and he's not going to get another Atrick probably this season. I mean, that's was a fantastic game, but I mean, he might Derek not get Ryan's, another one in his career. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a good player, but he's not a Hatrick guy. So does no. he, does he sustain his offensive jump? Let's put it that way. We won't put any points on it, but does he continue to be a force in the top nine where you can go, okay, well we don't, I mean, everybody's going to miss Pugliarvi. Everybody's going to miss Nugent Hopkins a little bit. But when you feel like you've got Derek Ryan and he's hot, but how hot do you think he can stay? Well, that's the million-dollar question, right? Um, in, the, in the case of Derek Ryan specifically, I don't think so. But there are other guys that are stepping up that I think we can see this consistently. That's more so the younger guys. Um, I, I just – I'm so encouraged. I, I'm going to be jumping ahead on this here too because I know we're going to talk about Yamo, but – I'm so encouraged with what I've seen from him, uh, Ryan McLeod. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the guys that we're seeing step up to contribute, I think a lot of them are going to be able to sustain this. Well, I've, I've noticed too, like Derek Ryan, he, he's almost looked more efficient on the wing, right? Like he hasn't been tasked yes. with worrying about getting back on D, being defensively responsible because he's had someone doing that for him. So I think that that takes a load off of a player you know, and, and allows them to be more creative and more, cheat a little bit more to get offense. Right. So I think we've seen that. And I think that that's, that'll help him be more effective. Right. So if you have someone else like Nuge, maybe he won't be the offensive, but if, as long as somebody else is there doing, doing the dirty work and allowing those guys to keep, keep moving the play offensively, I think it'll help you. Um, I, I, I don't like, Mc, I like, I rather have McLeod in the top six right now. He's going to probably slot in the third line center. I think there is still a move that you can make, uh, even if it's a minor one closer to the deadline, just to kind of, um, you know, stay in the mix and stay relevant um, because you want to give your team a little bit of a boost because they're going to be in a, in a weird position heading into the deadline. If, if they kind of, you know, win one, lose one, win one, lose one the rest of the way, because you got guys coming back. So you don't really know where everyone's slotting in um, or how they're going to do. And then you don't, you don't want to give up future assets to go make a big splash because you don't know if you're even going to make the playoffs because it's so tight. So I think that's going to be interesting to watch and we could probably unpack that further in the future, but um, it'll be, it'll be good to watch that. Am I wrong? If I say that I'm getting Fernando Pisani vibes from Derek Ryan, like, 
No, I, I don't know. I, I see that. Like, I don't, I don't want to put pressure on a guy and say, you got to get 14 goals in the playoffs, but like he's Fernando Pisani did that. He came out of nowhere, right? Like all of a sudden he's been so he was a solid player for them in 2006. He was a defensive guy who could play forward and he could probably, but he got on a streak and he hit that streak at the exact right time. And I'm, I'm just wondering if Derek Ryan's got that in him. Like it's that, funny too because uh, Pisani was an assistant coach on the Golden Bears when Derek Ryan was there in the last couple of years of his uh, career at the U of A, University of Alberta. Uh, wow. So yeah, the connect, there's all sorts of uh, six. That's it. It's intertwined. It's like destiny. Yes. Yeah, wouldn't that be yes. something? No, but I do get that vibe too. I think that's a great observation. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, like I said, I don't want to put pressure on the guy, but I mean, if if that happens for the Oilers, that's huge because when that happened for the Oilers in 2006, it was massive. Like it was. A different, a absolute difference maker. And Here, here's the thing I'll say about Ryan, though. I don't think he necessarily needs to be scoring that much to be a contributor. Now, maybe it's only in a role where he's playing like 10, 11 minutes a game, but I think like you look at what he does on the draw. I think there's a lot of things he can still bring to the game and and bring to the team in general as, as a veteran who I think is, he's showing, like if you've seen his interviews here in the last couple of weeks where he's been fairly outspoken about how things were, I, I think I think you're getting the sense now of the, the kind of guy, the character that he is and the leadership he provides. Well, and that's another reason why I say that. I mean, everybody loved Pisani, right? I mean, that was seemed like the nicest guy in the world was kind of laid back, but also kind of confident in his, his own ability when nobody else really figured like that he would be a major contributor. And then he just turned into this machine that, got hot for like 16 games and then he's like oh my gosh this guy's unbelievable unfortunately never really did much after that but like it, it worked out really well for that small window which would be fantastic for the Oilers if, if Ryan could hit a strider okay let's get back to the Koskinen talk because um, we've talked at great length about the goaltending uh, Brian is a huge supporter of Skinner I read your article about four reasons why Skinner should get some starts and, and things like that and I'm I'm with you but I I agree with you also that I don't know that he's going to get that look uh, Mike Smith played well enough, I think, uh, in one of the games against Carolina. I think he played right, or was it? I don't know which one. He played pretty he played good. Yeah, to the to he the still point gave where, up two goals early, but you know what? Yes. Those weren't on him. So no. and but I think enough to continue to get looks. And they only have what two and a half weeks now. It's March first today. They got till March twenty first to make a decision. And if Smith is playing just well enough and Koskinen's getting a little hot, I don't see Skinner getting a look here, but. You mentioned it, Brian, that Koskinen you think is the go-to guy now. I'm I'm with you on that. What's going to change that, if anything? Like, does Koskinen have to have a bad run here? Does he, if he just continues to play solid hockey, you know, he's good? And is he good enough at this point? Is he playing well enough if he continues to play that you actually look at this and go, eh, maybe we keep him, right? Like, because that's a lot of, everybody's just assuming that Koskinen's going to be going after this year. Yeah, that's an interesting discussion. Um... I mean, as far as right now, I've seen this before. I don't have any faith that Koskinen is going to be able to necessarily be <laughs> sustain this for an extended period of time. But he has been over the last several weeks, the far superior goalie between him and Smith. Yep. Like I still haven't seen anything to give me faith in Smith. It's it's more so the faith that I don't have in Smith than having renewed faith in Koskinen. Although Koskinen's playing very good right now. Um, but yeah, I, you know what, like if you could pick him up at say 1 million, I one and would, have to, yeah. Yeah. You know what? But I mean, who's your starter then? Right. Because that the only way I would do that is if let's say Skinner would have to get an audition and prove that he can be the guy. Uh, cause if you're keeping Koskinen around, then, you know, what, what, what is the rest of the goaltending situation like you sign someone else to be your number one and Skinner continues to toil away. Mm -hmm. in bakersfield like so i don't see how how that would all jive yeah yeah I'm yeah no there. yeah koskin is your backup if you keep him i don't think you do it for one i think you might get him for two two and a half if you're lucky um but i think well, he's yeah, probably playing himself into a better contract next year isn't he yeah and he's been solid enough he's the problem with koskin and that everybody whatever is is that he's not a starter everybody knows he's not a starter and, but they look yeah, at him like he should be exactly and he isn't Right. But if you put him in a backup, you're role, paying him have, the money of a starter. Right. Yeah. That's why so people if you're think paying him two and a half that. million, which might be a little high for a backup, but it's a decent salary for a back. And then he's in the right spot and nobody's bitching about it. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the reality of it. But right now he's getting paid four and a half and everybody wants to have a starter and they need a consistent one and we don't have one. And that's, that's the issue. Right. 
Um, what do you do, Julian? Do you run with Koskinen? Do you split them up? Do you keep getting them 50-50 out of fear that Koskinen is probably going to come back down to earth? A little yeah, bit I'm do? more I'm more along those lines. I think they I think what they were missing before is that balance between two goalies. So I would just like to see them get that that rotation established where you know, despite you know, they, they need two guys going if this is these are the guys they want in tandem in to me. Like no guy is, is gonna get the bulk of the starts because it just looks like they become too tired or too overworked that it always just falls apart and then you're back to square one again. So I think I think it's the the best thing for them would just be to keep the rotation going. You know, Smith gave you a good start in Carolina. You come back and you get Koskin in now and he gives you a shutout. Um it's hard not to go back to him next game, I'll say, just because, you know, he's coming off a shutout. So I'd probably give him the next one. But it, it, it can't be more than like a two-game stretch with the same starter for me. I would like to see that more of a constant rotation just because I think that that's the way you have to work the workload for them over that uh, over the rest of the time here. I got a question for both of you guys here. Uh, have you seen anything out of Mike Smith? I know he was decent in Carolina, but anything out of Mike Smith really for the entire season – and again, he's been in and out of the lineup with injuries, but he's played consistently here now for the last five weeks. Are you seeing anything to make you believe that this is a guy that you can even rely on to play 50% of the games? I don't think they have a choice, really. Like yeah. it, uh, this is this is the bed they made at the beginning of the season. Well, this they do have a choice, lie. but they're I mean well, yeah, they have a choice at the deadline. I mean, I'm not sure. Well, no, no, it's much- in he's in Bakersfield. That's where their choice is at. Yeah. I mean, I did write an article on that that you can waive them. Like you, you can absolutely see. Well, what do you if think would happen? Like, yeah, exactly. Right. What do you think would happen if he's placed on waivers? Somebody pick him up. You think so? Yep. I think so for 2 million bucks and he can get hot and there's enough teams that need a goalie. If that's I the case, then, then if that's the case and you actually think, and they, they believe someone would take that contract off their hands. I don't see why you wouldn't want that to happen because then you I, go I get think they're, I think they're worried. I, I think that the Oilers can haul in specifically knows that if Mike Smith can get hot, you're going to be kicking yourself if you've moved him. Right. And they are worried that if that happens and they miss out on Smith getting hot on a streak, that it could cost them a long playoff run. And they don't have enough confidence in Koskin and or Skinner because yeah. he's not proven yet that he can do it where Mike Smith has been that goalie in the past. He, I don't think he can be that goalie again, but I think he's been that goalie in the past. That's what they're looking at. And they go, man, if we get rid of him and he lights it up somewhere else, how stupid are we going to look, right? I think that's a legitimate concern for them. And they they are just holding out hope that he will get hot. I don't see it, but, I mean, it's possible. I think it would just be beneficiary for them in the long run, right? Not having that contract moving into next year if they someone else claims him, right? And then you, you're, you're basically starting fresh with a goal t- goaltending situation, and then you have Skinner that can work in as the backup because you're going to go get a, get someone or sign someone to starting starting caliber money, right? So I think in, in that situation, and then right now, if, if, you're, if you're worried about, you know, how, how you're going to sustain yourself now without a goaltender, then you go get one, right, from a team – like, like, like we're saying, you can get a similar player from another team. That's not necessarily an upgrade from what they already have. And they're ending up in the same position with, with money next season. Like why wouldn't New Jersey take them? Like I think they, they have would. teams no that need a goalie. Yeah, they got, they, I think they would. They, they would. They got, they had Dawes in net tonight. Like they have nobody and they'll be happy to sign him. They got money coming out their wazoo. Yep. They yeah. Two million bucks for next year. They take them. Right, like Arizona needs guys under contract. He's been there before. Why wouldn't they? Right, like it's Buffalo a guy the probably would take him. You know, yeah. like there's teams out there that would be like, yeah, man, I don't know. But hey, he's 39. He's two million bucks. He's a decent leader. He's competitive. Let's take a flyer on this guy. Right, like I think somebody would. Like I, I legitimate, but I also don't know if the others have even tried to trade him. Like so that that's another thing, right? Do you want to waive him and they get the free money and go? Okay, salary cap space. Now we go. I don't it. think. I don't think Holland would just because that's that's his decision he made at the beginning of the year and he's admitting his his wrongdoing. Yeah, that's why I say don't, I don't think it happens because I yeah. don't think Holland's gonna gonna suck that one. He back. stood, yeah, he stood by him by his goaltending all year, right? Yeah. And that's the way it's gonna end, I think. And you know what? If he proven to be right and, and and Smith gets hot, then we're all gonna be like, yay, Holland, right? Yeah. Like that's the reality of what's gonna happen here if it happens, right? All right, uh, final segment of the night. Brian, I'll start with you. Uh, plus one, minus one. Uh, who are you looking at? Do you have a positive? Do you have a negative? Somebody that you uh, that you noticed here? 
Yeah, I'll give it to Yamamoto. Uh, I just, I think he's really coming into his own. He's playing so consistently now, finding different ways to contribute. And now we're starting to see the goals come. I mean, he's, a, he's at 11 goals now. If uh, if you take out that slump or the, the slump that carried over from last season into the beginning of the season, he's on he's on a better than 20 goal pace. And, and he's scoring a key times. He's, he's scoring, you know, a greasy goal tonight. It's kind of stuff you need. So yeah, a uh, plus one for, uh, for young Caleb. What is he doing that he wasn't doing at the start of the year? And we talked about it repeatedly. Shouldn't what is he doing question. that he was, he's going to the net? Yeah, and he's shooting. Like, yeah. he's, he's doing we, – all we said at the beginning of the year was just shoot. You know what I mean? Like, just don't give it up. Don't get past it. Don't be, you know, so passive that you just let everybody – just do what you do. Go in, play hard, hit the net, shoot the puck. I mean, he even took a couple one-timers today. Like – he's he's playing pretty solid and kudos to him for blocking the shot coming back in i didn't even think he was going to play tonight like the way that they were talking it didn't sound like he was going to be a go and then he inserts him into the lineup and he gets the winning goal so like good for him right uh julian what about you do you have a plus one minus one i'm just going to stick to uh minus one actually you know i'll give you a plus and a minus but i'll start with the minus and that's going to be to care carolina's uh ice on ice crew over there with the uh plexiglass oh, fiasco that they had <laughs> Uh, they couldn't get their stuff together. So um, 10 minute delay there. So they got to shape up, but uh, my plus is just plus one's going to go to Derek Ryan for the hat trick that he had on the weekend because 33 years of age, um, you know, about time for him and congrats, congrats to him to finally getting it. My plus one and that Carolina crew thing was pretty <laughs> hilarious actually. And well, I don't know who was announcing the game. It was like uh, Dazdick or somebody said yeah. that they once played, in such a long delay that they canceled the rest of that period, let them go take a 20 minute break. Yeah, that and was... then they came back and played again. Like, can you Jazz imagine? Like... Yeah. How long that, how much annoying, how annoying that would have been. Uh, and the Oilers were getting hot yeah. at that time. Like they were just mounting to come back and then it all has to yep, go. They're pushing. Are, are you saying that that was rigged glass? Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> it was pretty funny when they got it caught in the net and they couldn't figure out how to get it out of there. Yeah. Uh, my plus one's going to go to Ryan McLeod. Uh, and I'll tell you why I think his work on the second power play unit has been yes. incredible. Now it hasn't necessarily clicked. Like I don't think that the Oilers power play in general has been hot. Like it was at the beginning of the year, but his ability to get on that second power play and fly through the neutral zone and break into the zone and set up the, the, I think it's huge. I think it's a massive, massive thing for the Oilers because it doesn't, it doesn't force with David or dry although they've done it a couple of times to be out there for a full two minutes. You've, and they've actually put Nurse on the first power play, which gives you Bouchard and Barry on the second with McLeod flying in there and setting up the zone. And it's, it's been good. You've got Kane on there if you want him. You could Hyman, look, whatever. So that second power play could be a massive weapon for them. And I think McLeod is the driver on it. I, I'll be, yes, sorry, I, I no, want to your opinion on this. Is I, I That honestly did not occur to me to give him that, put him in that position before. Uh, when we were talking about what to do with the power play, that never occurred to me. Did you see this coming from him? I've, I mean, I'm not patting myself on the back or nothing, but I have said it a couple of times on this show yeah. before that just watching him fly through the neutral zone is like watching McDavid in a way. He's just not as skilled, right? He's not figured that, but he is so fast and you can't stop him. If he gets open space in there, he's the one guy I think that can get into that zone, get in there and set things up then slow it down and move it around. And I think he's starting to do it. I think he's starting to build yeah. the confidence that he can get in that zone. And that's huge because when they didn't have McDavid, remember when he got hurt and he locks his teeth out or whatever, the Oilers could not gain that zone for the yeah. life of them. They got mm -hmm. a four minute power play out of that and did nothing with it. Absolutely yep. nothing. And that's where you need a guy like McLeod. And if he can figure out how to do that sort of thing and he can gain that zone and the Oilers can actually set up a power play without McDavid on the ice, then that's a big, big weapon well, for them. Credit, credit to Woodcroft too, because he knows the type of player he is and what he's yes. capable of doing. Right. So I think it's, it's kind of tailored to what he can do. So, I mean, that's helped him. And he's seen his ice time increase over the last couple of games. Like he was over, I think he was up over 20 minutes a game or two ago when maybe, maybe it was when McDavid went out. Um, but his ice time was up and, and, and same with Zach Hyman, actually, he, he played just under 25 minutes a night, which is the most on the team. And he had a, I think a season high 26 minutes last game. So he's been a horse and it's, it's weird to see that he's playing more minutes than like any of the forwards. Yeah. It'll be interesting to watch the times. Cause we used to talk when Woodcroft first came in about how they were lowering everybody's ice time, but now with these injuries it's, are snuck in yeah. and he's still playing 11, seven, the ice time's going back up again. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how tired these guys get. Okay. Well, let's call it. Uh, but let's do this before we say good night to everybody or good afternoon, whenever you're watching this. 
Let's call the Chicago game. So, uh, Brian, I'll start with you. Predict the game. Uh, if you want, predict the score. What do you think is going to happen against Chicago? Uh, who's starting in goal? That's the big question. For the Oilers? Uh, yeah. I would say Koskinen. Good question, actually. I would I would say he should start, but I would say Smith starts, and that changes my – you know, they're going to win. Do you yeah, – but would, will Wilcroft do that after a shutout? I don't think well, after a shutout. I – but like I get it. You go back and forth. And we talked about yeah. the 50-50 thing, but do you really do that after a shutout? I mean, I know Skinner got sent down to the minors after a shutout, but like, <laughs> yeah, I like to me, it's, I don't, I still wonder how much autonomy Woodcroft has in making the goaltending decisions. I wonder you how think much he's got to have at least the ability to make that call. Yeah. I think he makes that call. That's him. Well, we'll find out. I remember we were having this conversation two weeks ago and I said, Smith is going to start the next game. And yeah, you were right. So, yep. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they just want – whatever it is, they just have to keep playing this guy until – I don't know. Okay, well, that that in mind, with you asking that question, who do you think yeah. starts and then what do you think yeah. score? Yeah, the, I'm sorry for turning this into – No, that's all right. Rant, but, it's a good uh, question. Yeah, no, Oilers win 5-3. All right, Julian, what about you? I'm going to stick along the same lines. I was thinking 5-3, but I'm going to go 5-2, and I think Koskin is going to get the start and get the win. All right. Uh, I would love it. I don't know if it's going to happen. I would love another shutout. If you can get two in a row and you get both those guys, whether it's Smith or Koskinen, if you can get Koskinen in a second shutout, that would be huge for his confidence, right? I know that's unfair to say, hey, get two shutouts in a row, but that would be something. So I'm going to go three nothing Edmonton. Again, similar score to Philadelphia. I think they can shut down Chicago. Patrick Kane's always a weapon, but uh, I don't know that anybody else in Chicago has been terribly dangerous other than Dabrinkit. So, yeah. like, you know, like, it could be possible if they can get that going. And Chicago's got so much going on. New GM, lots of talk about who's getting yep. moved. I think there's some distraction there. So I believe that there's a possibility here. And if Smith can come in and get the shutout, even better. Okay, right? you heard it here first. Hammer the Oilers. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys, that's going to do it. I appreciate it. We'll have Colton back next week, and uh, we'll get the whole crew talking about whatever goes on here as they head back home and, and try, hopefully, to – get some momentum going and get some points on the board here and move themselves up to Pacific standings uh, for Julian, for Brian, for myself, Jim, uh, this is another edition of the THW Oilers overtime show for the hockey Raiders. Uh, thank you very much. We will talk to you guys next week. Have a fantastic week, everybody.